Hey there, welcome back to the podcast. This is Phil Vischer. This is the Holy Post Podcast. I am here with Sky Jatani. Hi, Phil. And Hi, everyone Sky. else. And Christian Taylor. Hello, Phil and everybody. Hello, Christian. And Jason Rugg. Hey there. Hi, Jason. Um, and we're going to have some fun today. This is It's the last podcast of the year. We're, we're trying to drag our sorry selves out of 2020. Because you know what's going to happen January 1st? Everything's going to be better, right? All Everything. the terrible things are going to be better. All the bad is going to go away because 2021 is a new year and it's going to be okay. That's not going to happen. Everything is going to be different. What, Christian? Why are, you, why are you being like that? I know I'm a downer, but I'm still on pain meds. I forgot. We do oh. two episodes at the same time. <laughs> Your payments haven't worn off yet. <laughs> okay, here's the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Christian. Okay, this is going to be fun. So, did you know that I did a video on... Uh, the history of evangelicalism in America. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It came out a few weeks ago. Um, generally good response. Uh, telling kind of the difference between basically Southern fundamentalism and Northern neo-evangelicalism as they developed over time. Northern evangelicalism being represented by guys like Harold Ockengay and, and Billy Graham. Southern fundamentalism being represented by people like uh, Bob Jones and Bob Jones and Bob Jones University. And what is the difference? So I did that. At the end of it, I was talking about some fundamentalist tendencies that you still see today, like the propensity to declare enemies, you know, who's our enemies. And I used a picture of uh, Westboro Baptist folks, you know, declaring enemies. Or then the next one was um, the denial of mainstream science or rejection of mainstream science. And I was trying to figure out what picture to put for that. And I thought, uh, do I put up, you know, a picture of anti-mask people or anti-vaxxers or, or you know. it's riding a dinosaur. Or, <laughs> or what? <laughs> and, and honestly, my thought was, I think I have anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers in my family. And I don't want to offend anyone. So I'll put up a picture of Ken Ham and a dinosaur. Because he's not in your family. Because he's not a, a relative of mine. So I just put up a because I had I was looking like what pictures do I have around so I don't have to go buy a new picture. It's, it's be expensive to buy stock photos. I was like oh I have a picture of, of Ken Ham and at the Creation Museum you know with the dinosaur, and that's you know I mean everybody kind of looks at him as someone who doesn't accept mainstream science. Well, um, and you have talked about him before, and yeah, it's podcast. come up. So I did that. So someone cut out that little clip and either maybe one of his people cut it out and sent it to him and said, Ken, look what Crater Veggie Tales is saying about you, that you reject mainstream science. Oh, so he no. tweeted that the Crater of Veggie Tales says, I reject mainstream science. I do not. I reject pagan religion, which is uh, the belief in the Big Bang and blah, blah, blah. And so then people tweeted that at me saying, oh, look what Kevin Ham said about you. He's mad at you. You're in wow. trouble now. I don't, so, I don't get it, though, because I saw some of this on Twitter. And what I don't understand yeah. is mainstream science affirms things like the Big Bang. And so for Ken Ham to reject the Big Bang is to reject mainstream science. So he said, I don't reject mainstream science. I just reject mainstream science. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I pointed what, that What did you do that was wrong is my question, I guess. Um, well, I think what people really thought I did wrong is what happened next. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, because, I can't wait for this. Because then I did, I did a little tweet thread on, well, and it wasn't to Ken. It wasn't, I wasn't talking to, directly to Ken, but like, here is, you know, I think the history of of the side of creationism that Ken Ham represents, uh, and how it's really not a very old thing. It's actually a rather new, like six thousand years, <laughs> roughly. <laughs> yes, Christian. Yes, so Christian. I just remember you asked David French. 
a question about how you handle Twitter. And his answer to you was, you just put stuff out there. Don't respond to anybody. Yeah. But don't, but you, you got don't sucked hold that in. up. You did don't, not listen to yeah, David I know, French. I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm not good at it. I'm not good at not responding to people. So I did this little thing, you know, because one of the facts that I threw out is that, in fact, specifically about young earth creationism, the fundamental papers that we just went through in the history of evangelicalism, none of them promote a young earth. None of the fundamentalist papers promote a young earth. It's a newer belief. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Back that up because people need to know what you're talking about. The fundamentalist papers were from the 1920s. Yeah, 1910 to 1909 to 1915. Okay. And they were written to combat the modernism the modernism that was creeping into the church and they laid out what the fundamentals of christianity are yes yes and none of them were about a young earth creationist interpretation of genesis one no right no uh okay that made people mad because they believe i was reading them wrong and so a guy who's the head of an apologetics ministry in texas somewhere sent my tweet thread to a friend of his who's the head of a young earth ministry who's an astrophysicist somewhere and he wrote a long blog post refuting my tweet thread point by point so he like won. a two, two page blog post which made it sound like i was completely out to lunch which I, in fact, I did learn some things from his blog post. It was helpful. Uh, I don't think I was entirely out to lunch. And then in the meantime, our friend Drew Dick, do you know Drew Dick? Uh-huh. I do. He's funny. Yeah. He tweeted at me. He said, Phil, I think you're going to be banned from the Creation Museum. <laughs> I And, you know, it's me and Drew on Twitter. So you have to say Uh-oh. something back that's even funnier or, or, or he wins. So I said, it's okay. I'll sneak in the back door where the dinosaurs go outside to poop. Because they've got animatronic dinosaurs. And I thought that was funny to think that the animatronic dinosaurs have to go outside to poop. (laughs) (laughs) And people people thought that was very funny. So Ken Ham gets a hold of that, which he wasn't on that. So then he writes a long... Wait, 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 wait. Stop, (laughs) stop, 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 stop. Right here. (laughs) We are not going any further. It's funny. You cannot show outrage. It's just a joke. Somebody is going to take some. You are responsible for what you say on Twitter and everywhere else. And you know, just as well as anybody else, that once you say it online... The world will have it. Who? Uh, nobody has to tell you this, Phil Fisher. I was trying to make Drew Dick laugh. Yeah, but hum- it's one of my favorite things. <laughs> Humor and sarcasm often get lost in in social media. I do not feel sorry for you one bit about this controversy. Oh. So wait, did Ken, did Ken Ham assume that you assumed that they had actual dinosaurs pooping behind the Creation Museum? No. Okay, good. No. So he wrote a Facebook post about me. Ken Ham himself, like he has time for this, wrote a Facebook he post does. about me. But he also gathered because when that thing started off and, and my Twitter handle and Ken Ham's Twitter handle were attached to the same comments, lots of people started commenting, some Duh. of them trashing me and Duh. some of them trashing Ken Ham. Duh. So Ken Ham screenshotted all of the Twitter comments that were trashing him and said, look what Phil Vischer and his friends are saying about me. They're attacking me. And Phil even made you know, a mocking joke about the Creation Museum. And he posted that on his Facebook page, which led to lots of people getting mad at me and coming to my Facebook pages. And then now, which we, I just mentioned before, Julie uh, and I are having to monitor our Facebook ads for Mr. Phil TV because Ken Ham fans are showing up on them to tell people not to buy any of my stuff for kids. Now, Phil, I just have to say one thing. First of all, you mentioned that before we ever started recording. But second of all, you are going to just have to decide to live in this conundrum of you know, telling truth to kids and telling truth to adults, you know, if you're going to do both, you're going to be like in the middle of the firing line. (laughs) So I research things more and I find out, did I get it wrong? Did I get it right? Where was I wrong? I want to know what I said, you know, that was wrong or right. And I want to be 
I want to have my facts straight. I respect so that. I did over the weekend a ton of reading to see what was what I said factually accurate that the movement of creationism that Ken Ham represents is a relatively young movement uh, and doesn't go way way back in church history. So it's, and the it's answer the YCM the young creationist movement YEC no YCM young earth, young earth creationists um, and the answer is yes and no if you just talk about you know, people believing the earth was young, that goes way, way, way back because there wasn't really a compelling reason to not believe that. And people, you know, especially in the Christian West, people read the Bible and said, oh, so God created things in six days. And then the, here's the genealogy from Adam to Jesus. And there you go, bada boom, bada bing. And that's what led, you know, guys like Bishop Usher in the 17th century to say, creation happened. And he actually had a specific day on this day in this month, in this year, and it was 4004 BC or something like that. Wait, so, wait, 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 wait. How wouldn't it be like, oh, whatever, never mind. 6,000 years ago. Okay, I got it. Okay, so that's kind of the position. Like, okay. So, so, and I had said in my tweet thread, you know, yes, there have been people promoting a young earth going way, way, way back, but the specific form of alternate science promoted by Ken Ham is a relatively young movement. And people are like, no, it goes, in fact, Ken Ham said, no, it goes back forever. Oh, but wait so a minute, here, but his, his vision of science is a direct response to evolution. All right, and this is what I want to get into. Evolution is only 150 years old. This is what I want to get into. What I was talking about is a field of study called flood geology. This is the specifics of what I want to get into. Okay, flood geology is a, uh, if we go back to the 1600s, when people were starting to look, and even before then, people were looking at fossils. You know, they would, they, you would dig into the ground and you would see, wow, the dirt kind of changes. Or you'd look at the side of a cliff and you would see, wow, look at, there's like levels, like a layer cake. There's layers and there's different kinds of fossils. You see different kinds of critters in different layers. How did all that happen? And in the Christian West, many of the people doing that research were clergy, you know, going back historically. And so they're looking at the Bible to figure out what is this? And some of them decided, well, maybe all of that was laid down by Noah's flood. You know, maybe this is how things formed. And then trying to figure out other ideas, like you find a big boulder and it's 10 miles from where it would have come from as part of a mountain. You know, this, and they call them erratic boulders, boulders that aren't where they ought to be. Um, well, how wanna, did they get? I think you, I can like think of a lot name? of other things that are, could be erratic boulders. Anyway, go ahead. Er, er, erratic boulders. So water probably moved it there. That could have been the end of Noah's flood. You know, when all the waters drained away, it carved the rivers and it did all this. So people were thinking that way back in the 15, 1600s as they were starting to poke around in the dirt and try to draw scientific conclusions. When we get to the 1700s, and that was still generally in the realm of we think the Bible probably lays out the timeline of the universe, you know, and of the creation of the earth. So it's probably thousands of years old. Um, in 1695, a guy named John Woodward came up with a more specific theory, which was that the Genesis flood sky, you're not even listening. This is very disappointing because your dog wants to go out of your office. The Genesis flood, um, created like melted all of the rocks into a slurry and this big slurry of melted rocks, like dissolved rocks, then covered up all the living things and then hardened. And that's where all the fossils came from. Okay. That sounds a little bit more crazy or far-fetched than the one before. So that was one idea. That was one idea. The 1695 John Woodward dissolving rock in a slurry theory. Well, was there any science behind that theory? No. No, this is the 1600s. There wasn't a whole lot of science behind a lot of theories. Now, in the 1700s, modern science of geology starts developing. The word geology is used for the first time. Um, people are still, and these are, again, largely 
clergy that are doing this work, people are still using the Genesis flood as something that reshaped the earth. But as they're looking at the layers and the layers upon layers, many are concluding one flood couldn't do all of this. So maybe it was a series of cataclysmic events that the Noah flood was the last one. Okay, at this point, a young earth doesn't really work anymore because you need ages and ages of these big cataclysmic events. So a lot of Christian scientific thinkers moved away in the eight, uh, late 1700s to early 1800s, moved away from thinking the world was literally as young as you know a, a surface reading of Genesis says so. We need more time for more cataclysms. Uh, this was... Uh, it was flood geology said, now you need multiple floods. And the Noah flood was just the last one. So by the 1800s, multiple flood events were proposed to explain all the layers of the deposits. The Noah's flood was the most recent. The idea of a young earth was largely rejected. Uh, clergymen, scientists like William Buckland from the Church of England still had to, held to the Genesis flood as a literal event, but thought it was the last of a long sequence of these big events and the only one during the time of humans. Okay, so that's the early 1800s. 1820s, that started, the notion of flood geology started to become criticized, for example, by Pastor John Fleming of the Church of Scotland, who said, why do we find uh, tropical animals and plants that we only find in the tropics today fossilized in the north, way, way up in the north? I don't think the, that's how he sounded. I think he had yeah, a different exactly accent, how he sounded. Can you say that again? The, the, the Genesis flood could not possibly have moved tropical plants from the tropics to the north and then reburied them there and pointed out things like, like things like woolly mammoths. We never find their fossils in the tropics. We only find them up where it was cold. So there seems to be consistency in where fossils were buried to where they lived. So the Genesis flood as the source of all movement of fossils started to fall out of fashion, didn't seem to make sense. Um, and also, and this was interesting, Fleming, who was the a Church of Scotland pastor, said the Genesis account of the flood is just too gentle to explain all of this, because as the floodwaters receded, a dove could fly out and find an olive tree and come back with a branch. And if the, the Genesis flood was so violent that it sh shaped all the mountains and dug all the rivers and moved fossils all over the earth, how on earth would olive trees survive through that cataclysm to still be there for the dove? So by 1830, everyone had abandoned flood geology because we were also now learning about ice ages and glaciation. And that glaciers, maybe it was actually glaciers that moved all those boulders and carved things, and not the draining of the water from the Genesis flood. So by basically by 1840, flood geology had disappeared um, and was replaced by ice ages, glaciation, and a much older earth. And among Christians, most uh, learned Christians had moved on to an old earth um, and had given up on the idea of young earth geology by 1840. Okay, Where that didn't happen is among Seventh-day Adventists. And the reason it didn't happen among Seventh-day Adventists is that the co-founder of Seventh-day Advent Adventism, Ellen White, had visions that were considered divinely inspired. And one of Ellen White's visions uh, in the 1860s was of the Noah Flood. She had a vision of the Noah Flood. Here's the description. It was published as a book in 1864. Uh, her vision described a catastrophic deluge which reshaped the entire surface of the earth, followed by a powerful wind which piled up new high mountains, burying the bodies of men and beasts. Buried forests became coal and oil. So all of the oil and coal deposits came from the forests being buried by these winds after the Noah Flood. Uh, and then God later caused all this to burn when it reacted with limestone and water to cause earthquakes, volcanoes, and fiery issues. So the earthquakes, volcanoes, are all limestone reacting with fire from God after the Noah flood. It was a very scientifically specific vision that she wrote down in a book. And um, her followers in, in the Church of Seventh-day Adv Adventism sold those books door to door around the country. Okay. 
one of the guys selling Ellen White's books around the country was a guy named George McCready Price. He sold her books door to door. He was really interested in geology. So he started writing about evolution and geology based on Seventh-day Adventist teaching, which needed a young earth for Ellen White's visions to be true and divinely inspired. Can I stop you right here? Yeah, you with me? I'm still with you. I'm still wondering. You did all of this research just like over the weekend? Yeah. That's a I lot. needed to know. Well, I knew the rough outlines of this, which is what I tried to tweet. But when people, you know, when an astrophysicist was poking holes in my rough outline, I was like, okay, I'll, I need to dig in okay. deeper. Uh, to summarize up to this point before you continue, Phil, what yes. you're basically saying is through a lot of history, pre-scientific history, people just accepted the Bible's timeline of creation because they had no reason not to. Once the origins of modern science start investigating fossils and, and geology and stuff like that, it becomes apparent that you need a longer timeline to explain these naturally occurring phenomenon. And a lot of Christians go, okay, fine. But to those who have to hold on to a short timeline, they do so not because of scientific evidence, but in order to maintain the authority of their religious leaders who are having revelations it's that require crazy. a short time. Here's, here's the deal. By 1900, uh, belief in a young earth, because the Bible says so, was almost gone entirely from the American church, except in Seventh-day Adventism and... Missouri Synod Lutherans, because there was a Lutheran scholar who was teaching a young earth in the Missouri Synod. Okay. So th there were there were pockets uh, of, of young earth still in the early 1900s, but for the most part, it was almost entirely gone. So George McCready Price starts writing new books based on Ellen White's visions and his own kind of, you know, closet geology study. And he uh, ultimately wraps them all up into um, a textbook because public schools are teaching evolution, which he doesn't like, but they're also teaching old earth, which he doesn't like because he's a Seventh-day Adventist. So he crafts all of this flood geology and expands upon it. He basically reintroduces flood geology uh, to the United States in the form of a textbook called A New Geology. So he was presenting an alternate geology to what schools were teaching. And this was um, 1900? 1920. Okay. You're going to have to do a whole new video because we're getting so deep in, I need visuals. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, he founded uh, the, the, Delu the, the Deluge Geology Society. A deluge is a, is a great rainstorm or a flood. Oh. So it's basically the Flood Geology Society. This is founded in Los Angeles in 1938. This is the precursor to modern creation science that we have today. Initially, it was almost entirely Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, but there was one independent Baptist that joined the group whose name was Henry Morris. Joined the group in the 1940s, got really into it. He started doing his own writing about a young earth and flood geology. Uh, he was a hydrologist, uh, a civil engineer hydrologist. Really liked that idea. So he started writing books. And then he met a guy named John Whitcomb, who was an Old Testament professor of Grace, Grace Seminary in Indiana, in Winona Lake, Indiana, which is where- Winona um, Ryder's from. <laughs> which is where Bob Jones was sitting on a chair next to uh, uh, William Jennings Bryan talking about how evil evolution was the, the year before the Scopes Monkey Trial. It's in my video. So, okay, they, hold on a second, though. How much of what, what we think of today as young earth creationism was fueled by a desire to come up with an alternative to Darwin's theory of evolution and how much of it was a response to predating Darwin, the geological stuff that was coming out and the need for ice ages and all of that, which predates Darwin, but people, you know, Seventh-day Adventists were freaking out about. Right. The two men in early 20th century America who were the warriors against Darwinism, okay, the two men responsible 
for five states banning the teaching of evolution were William Jennings Bryan and another early fundamentalist named William Bell Riley, who was in Minneapolis. Is called, uh, his nickname is the Old Man of Fundamentalism. They were anti-evolutionists. Um, William Jennings Bryan founded, uh, what was the group that he founded? Oh, I'm sorry. William Bell, Bell Riley founded the World Christian Fundamentals Association. William Jennings Bryan was the prosecutor in the Scopes Monkey Trial. And a multiple-time Democratic candidate for president and secretary yes. of state. Yes. So very, both... Really, Brian, very famous. William um, Bell Riley, fairly famous. So these are the fundamentalists of fundamentalists who fought to stop the teaching of evolution. Neither of them believed the earth was young. In fact, uh, William Bell Riley said, as far as he was concerned, there was, and this is an exact quote, there was not an intelligent fundamentalist who claims that the earth was made 6,000 years ago, and the Bible never taught any such thing. Wow. So he, th he thought it was embarrassing to say that the earth was young. William Jennings Bryan- It takes a lot to embarrass a fundamentalist. Of, of, uh, who started an anti-evolution society. Yes. William Jennings Bryan- believed talking about literal six-day creation was a straw man argument to make fundamentalists look dumb. Uh, he said that the op opponents of fundamentalist Christianity accuse, and this is a quote, accuse fundamentalists of believing such things just as they accuse orthodox Christians of denying the roundness of the earth and the law of gravitation. Mm. So for Brian, uh, believing the earth was young was like believing the earth was, was flat. For, for uh, Bell Riley, believing the earth was young was a sign that you were an unintelligent fundamentalist. Okay, so, but however, I'm, my brain is confused, and maybe it is because I'm still on pain meds, but those things sound contradictory, that they can be against evolution and yet hold those beliefs. Or am I actually making some sort of sense? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh -huh. It's a good question. Yes. So today, I don't know how many Christians would agree with this, but a huge percentage of conservative Christians would say um, to be against evolution is to believe the earth is young. And if they're, they're like part and parcel, they're the same package. You need to believe in a young earth and you need to believe that creation didn't happen. Um, that is a fairly recent belief. And here's the rest of the story, how that came into being. Tell so us, this, Paul Harvey. The, the Seventh-day Adventists never stopped believing in a young earth. Almost everyone else did. In fact, the authors of the fundamentals, you know, the 93 essays that defined fundamentalist Christian belief, one of them was a theistic evolutionist who believed that evolution actually happened just the way Darwin said it did, but God helped guide it. Uh, that we think today is a radical brand new idea, you know, that came about from the, the pit of hell. I mean, that's what the BioLogos group is that Ken Ham and others think is evil. Um, that was one of the main authors of the fundamentals. He wrote, he wrote the, uh, his name was, um, hang on, I got, oh, James Barr. James Barr wrote the fundamentalist essay in 1910, Science and Christian Faith. And he believed, uh, this is a quote from James Barr, evolution is coming to be recognized as but a new name for creation, only that the creative power now works from within instead of, as in the old conception, in an external plastic fashion. So he believed evolution was how God created. Okay. He was one of the main writers of the fundamentals. He wrote the essay called Science and Christian Faith. So Theistic evolution is considered today the most liberal form of creationism, the most progressive, the most, you know, that needs to be rejected. Um, so Henry Morris comes along. Henry Morris is reading um, the new geology of the seven, Seventh-day Adventists, really likes it. He joins the Deluge Geology Society in Los Angeles, and then he gets together with John Whitcomb of Grace Seminary in Winona Lake, Indiana, and writes a book that's published in 1961 called The Genesis Flood. And this is the book that creates modern creationism. 1961. And, 
1961. Yes. And what he's basically taking is uh, the arguments of McCready Price and the Seventh Day Adventists and repackaging them, elaborating on them, and then doing something very interesting, which hadn't really been done before, which was to say, if you are rejecting a literal six-day creation, you're rejecting the authority of the Bible. And if you reject the authority, if the rejecting the authority of the Bible, remember now we're headed into the 60s, is why the world is going mad. So uh, Morris starts linking evolution, belief in evolution, with abortion, euthanasia, uh, pornography, uh, you know, atheism. So almost every, I mean, crime, linking belief in evolution with rising, exploding crime in the 1960s. All of the evils of society are now linked to the rejection of the authority of the Bible. And the rejection of the authority of the Bible is what happens when you say the world wasn't created 6,000 years ago. Boy. So that's now, as of, as of the mid-1960s, the age of the earth becomes a culture war issue, not just a theological issue. Uh, Henry Morris goes on to found the Creation Research Society in 1963, which becomes what is today the Creation Research Institute, which is the second biggest creation uh, promotion company except or ministry except Answers in Genesis. Ken Ham in Australia, when he's in college, reads Henry Morris's book, The Genesis Flood starts teaching it in Australia, decides he wants to come to America and work with Henry Morris. So he moves to America and starts touring churches on behalf of Henry Morris's group. Um, and the Genesis Flood starts his own group in 1979, um, moves to the U.S. in 1980, and then founds Answers in Genesis in 1994. So he actually came out of Henry Morris's group and founded his own group, which then became twice as big as Henry Morris's group. And the and the that's key, because he how knows how to do things like on Twitter to get people yeah, to follow him, right? And build a museum from yep. from the get go. Building a museum was his goal. And this is interesting because I just read a book uh, called Creationism USA, which is a a historian, uh, a non Christian historian trying to unpack the rise of creationism in the United States. Hmm, so it's that's a, interesting. A, yeah, it's a non-Christian historical work on the history of creationism. And he believes something interesting happened in the 60s, which is creationists like Henry Morris, um, and then you know going on in the future into Ken Ham, uh, gave up on the notion of winning the argument in colleges, in you know institutions in science uh handbooks you know because back when back when it was William Jennings Bryan and William Bell Riley they were trying to win the argument in the broader public you know that's what the scopes monkey trial was about we need to show people that evolution is wrong the strategy changed in the 1970s basically to we're going to lose our kids if we don't teach our kids what they should believe uh, which is why the focus of Answers in Genesis and the focus of some of these other groups are primarily about curriculum for kids. And then the homeschooling movement comes in, and the homeschooling movement uh, blows up just as all of this Henry Morris-inspired young earth creationist uh, curriculum is written, so that millions of kids across the country who have been pulled out of public schools, partly because you know, of evolution, but also other things, are getting a curriculum that, that links rejection of evolution specifically to acceptance of a young earth, literal seven-day creation, six-day creation, and includes flood geology in all of that. Okay. Oh, I mean, it, mm -hmm. it kind of makes mm -hmm. Kind of makes sense why you would bring those things together, though, because if you're rejecting evolution, you don't need millions and millions of years for life to evolve. So why not then take a young Earth view of of geology, right? right? So right, it, 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 it was. It, it, I think I find it interesting that the founding fathers of fundamentalism didn't do that. Well, here, okay, that's what I want to get to, which I think is an interesting insight from from what you're the timeline you're lining up here in the early 20th century when people are freaking out about modernism 
there's a, uh, I suppose, a natural uh, response to want to defend the fundamentals of the faith. And that leads to, you know, the writing of the fundamentals. But when you get to the 1960s, there's something else going on because it isn't like the 1960s were an intellectual attack on Orthodox Christianity. The 1960s was a was an era of social chaos, right? Just upheaval in all kinds of forms, political, social, um, economic, racial, it just goes on and on. And from what I've read about fundamentalisms in general is the the real psychological draw of fundamentalisms is that it simplifies a complicated world. It takes a chaotic reality and makes it really, really simple for you to understand so that you can turn off part of your brain and feel in control again. And so it makes sense to me that the young earth creationism would really find fertile ground in the 1960s and 70s, because as the culture is spinning seemingly out of control, young earth creation comes along and offers a really, really simple answer. I mean, the fact that it's called Answers in Genesis is brilliant because the simple answer is if people would just take Genesis 1 and 2 literally, all of these problems that you're seeing would be solved. That's yeah. not what they were doing in the 1920s. No. In the 1920s, they weren't saying the whole world is going crazy and here's a really simple answer to explain it. What they were saying is there's these deep intellectual concerns coming out of European intellectualism that we need to respond to intellectually as Orthodox believers. In the 1960s and 70s, it was a totally different thing. And that makes sense why young earth creationism would emerge in that moment rather than in the 1920s when it was okay to believe in an old earth and reject Darwinism. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is the real battle in the 1920s, 19-teens, 1920s was over biblical inerrancy. Right. You know, are we saying the Bible is inspired by God and free from error? Or is it a man-made document that's still useful? You know, it's got some great stuff in it, but it's, you know, it's hist- it's really old and it's full of mistakes. But even that's interesting because their stand on inerrancy did not mean taking Genesis 1 literally. That's the, fu- that's they, the interesting part. They understood that Genesis 1 was poetry. They viewed, yeah. And so the rebellion of Henry Morris... Um, and John Whitcomb, when they wrote their book, was a rebellion against any reading of Genesis 1 and 2 other than the most obvious surface level reading. You know, it's, 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 the, it's the equivalent of, of reading Paul and saying, so women must cover their heads in church because that's what he says, you know, and they cannot ask questions in church because that's what Paul says. You know, so it's that kind of reading where, you know, superficial sounds like it's an insult and I'm not meaning to insult it, but it's, I'm going to read this and the most obvious meaning is the one I'm going to take based on what comes to my mind right now in my, in my setting. You know, so if you read Paul talking about women in church, the most obvious reading is Paul says women can't talk. Well, but if you take the whole Bible that way, the most obvious reading of the Sermon on the Mount is I should gouge out my eye. Exactly. Why, what are you confessing? What did your eye do? Uh, nothing. Oh, okay. So that's what the battle is about. Is and, and that's why, you know, one of the things that Henry Morris and John Whitcomb and then others like Ken Ham did was rather than fighting, rather than seeing the culture as the enemy, which they do, but it's not the it's not their primary target. Their primary target is Christians who say they believe the Bible, but disagree with us about Genesis 1. So Henry Morris in the mid-1970s traveled to Wheaton College to speak at Wheaton College about how you should read Genesis 1. Now and about, we're getting close to home. <laughs> yeah. And he was stunned that none of the faculty at Wheaton College agreed with him. And this was in the 1970s, you said? Yeah, 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 mid 1970s, because there was a guy last name Mixter. Forget his first name. Oh, tell me he was a DJ. Mixter <laughs> at Wheaton College. Uh, he was a science professor, and in the mid 1950s, um, he did the equivalent of what John Walton is doing today, of saying, "I don't really think there's a conflict between evolutionary theory and the Bible." if you assume that God guides the process. Or if you assume that you should read Genesis as the original ancient Jewish audience would have read it. Now, that's John Walton's point of view. Right. 
Yes, they weren't they weren't there yet because they didn't have access to the ancient Near East writings okay. that we do today. I, to his do name that was Mister Mixter. Mixter, and I yes, or Doctor Mixter. I mean, come on, he could be doing weddings and bar mitzvahs. So, so what a okay, great so, brand. So we've been. I was surprised. Hang on, Christian, just just one second. I was surprised, you know, what the first time I went to Wheaton College to the science department and saw the big woolly mammoth, you know, that the students excavated in Glen Ellen in the mid 1960s and they had a plaque under it that said this lived 20,000 years ago, just completely blowing away any thought of being, you know, okay with a young earth. Um, and that that had been their position in the 1960s, you know, until I, I'm reading this history and it was in the mid 1950s that Wheaton College faculty started moving uh, on this issue of saying, well, maybe there isn't this conflict. You know, maybe there isn't, uh, maybe we can, and, and for a conservative, what was considered historically a fundamentalist school, you know, to completely move away from uh, having a problem with evolution. Well, they were one of the first evangelical schools to do that. But it is, I didn't know this. I'm grateful for the history, Phil. But it is fascinating that even the leaders of fundamentalism in the 1910s and teens and 20s thought a young, a young earth view was not scientific yes. and not, and it was antithetical to the Bible. That was the fundamentalist view. Yes. So in a way, Wheaton College has been in continuity with this for the last hundred years. And I often run into people when I used to travel who would say, you're from Wheaton? Do you know Wheaton College? And, oh, yeah, I live there. and some people will be like, oh, Wheaton's so liberal. Yes. And you ask why? You know, well, they don't, you know, they teach evolution or they teach. You know, you know why they're aware of that? Because Ken Ham publishes a list of Christian colleges that it's okay to send your kids to. Oh. He maintains a list. And if a Christian college does not teach young earth flood geology, they don't make Ken Ham's list. And because he's so influential with homeschoolers, Christian kids grow up knowing that they shouldn't go to Wheaton College if they're taking answers in Genesis curriculum but, because it's not on the list. But you would, so you would assume from that kind of a statement that there was a time 100 years ago where Wheaton did affirm a young earth creationism and drifted away from it over the influence of liberalism. But in fact, they've never been there because that's not what fundamentalism was or evangelicalism. Right. There was a rejection of Darwinian evolution right. at Wheaton College. Uh, Blanchard was quoted, you know, rejecting Darwinian evolution. And, and William Jennings Bryan rejected Darwinian evolution. And William Bell Riley rejected Darwinian evolution. And R.A. Torrey, who was the editor of The Fundamentals, rejected Darwinian evolution. But all of them were old earth creationists. Christian, yes? So this is interesting. <laughs> Because I was Do you have a Chardonnay say, hidden behind the camera there that we can't see? <laughs> Are you now reviewing the podcast? I found this episode interesting. <laughs> this is interesting because before this last part, I was going to say, I'm very uncomfortable, Phil, because all of the stuff that you're unpacking makes me work really hard, even though you did the work all weekend, makes me work really hard to look back at all of the things that led up to what I was taught as a young girl in my Sunday school class. And now you're asking me to look behind the curtain and see how all of those things came together. And you're educating me, right? You're educating me on all of the foundations of that. And so my brain is going, oh my gosh, I, it's almost shorting out. And then I'm realizing at the same time that Ken Ham is sending out this list of all of the colleges not to send your children to. Phil Vischer is putting out videos that homeschool parents all over the world and Christian parents all over the world are letting their kids watch. So now you have this epic battle on Twitter where... where do, you, do you see why Ken Ham can't let this go? Yes. I mean, this is... Yeah, this is you're a threat. This is exactly the problem is people like me, colleges like Wheaton, that don't say this is the only way you can read Genesis if you believe the Bible is inerrant, and completely ignore the fact that the biggest, um, the biggest proponents of inerrancy didn't read Genesis this way from the very beginning. 
But that's what I'm saying. Like, th- that's kind of why I'm so uncomfortable. Because I, I saw this video. It was a thing that Hunter sent me, actually. And it was basically like how when you hear something over and over and over again, uh, your brain just accepts it as truth. And it be- you become comfortable with that and and almost lazy. And so when new information is introduced, it makes you very uncomfortable and and you kind of don't like it. And it's it's sort of the same thing as you're unpacking all of the stuff and I'm hearing, you know, I'm hearing this education, I think if if I hadn't been on this podcast for so long, I would have been very uncomfortable by that. And interestingly enough, it's the education that all of these people are writhing against, whether it's education from science or education even from Wheaton or you trying to educate people on the history of how we got there, here from there. Um, That's, boy, that education stuff can really mess people up. Did can we quote? Can we, yeah, I, you know, can, we, can we quote you on that? I think what I messes what messes people up is probably not any of the details of what you just shared, Phil, or even the thought of a uh, more a, a longer timeline for creation or what. I don't think any of that's what messes people up. I think what messes people up is if if you're right, or if Ken Ham is wrong, then the world suddenly becomes more complicated. Yes. Then the way to fix the problems in the world becomes more complicated. Yes. Then raising children becomes more complicated. Then being a Christian becomes more complicated. And there's a lot of people out there who just want things simple. And what what Ken Ham is really selling people is not a, a theological interpretation of Genesis. What he's selling them is simplicity. He's selling them a very simple way of understanding everything wrong in the world and how to keep yourself safe and your family in the midst of it. And in that regard, this is going to get me in trouble. I would argue that's a false gospel. Because the good news news is not that God created the world in seven days, 6,000 years ago. The good news is that he came and dwelt among us as his son took away our sins on the cross, rose from the dead, and we put our trust in him as a person, not in one person's interpretation of Genesis. Amen. Preach it, brother. Boy, he can sum it up so much better than I can. Well, if he was on the drugs you're on, he might struggle too. (laughs) But he also, you're more entertaining when you try to sum it up than he is. Uh, Sky, are you a fan of slippery slope arguments? Not really, no. Okay. That is a huge part of Ken Ham style young earth creationism is that if you give up on this part of the Bible as being literally, you know, on on its face value true, what's next? And eventually you, you know, you give up on a literal Adam and Eve, then you give up on, you know, and then how can you have Jesus who's bringing life if, you know, Adam and Eve didn't bring death, a literal death. And it's just, it's, it goes like bowling pins that if this one falls, this one falls. So for me to go back and say, wait a minute, the people that started the war against Darwinism and for believing the Bible is literally true, don't believe what you believed, Ken. Right. Because... They understood, as John Walton would say, you take the literal parts of the Bible literally and you take the figurative parts figuratively. You don't take the poems of the Psalms all literally. God does not have wings that we hide under. It's poetry. And Genesis 1 is, it is poetry. And even the- No, it's not. What what Tim Keller would say, it's not true poetry because it's not couplets. There's no, you know, there's no parallelism. Yes, there is. There is absolute parallelism. The first, the first three days of creation match, day one matches day four, and day okay. two matches but day parallel, five. Parallelism and, like in the Psalms and yes, Proverbs. Yes, fine, but it, 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 is, it is a Ooh, clearly, it is a he constructed. Would, Keller, Keller would say Genesis 1 and 2 are exalted prose. Fine. L- like John 1. Fine. Pick, yes, pick, pick, pick your genre title that you want to use exa- here. That there's some, and that's what, what makes them hard, hard to yeah. interpret be- because they kind of sound historical and they kind of sound poetic because they're not, there's something in the middle. And that makes it, you know, so, so Keller believes um, that Genesis 1 was, well, Walton believes it's a temple dedication text. Yeah. It was meant to be recited aloud 
at a temple dedicated, like the temple dedication of Solomon's temple, which was uh, a seven day ceremony, also a seven day ceremony. And on the seventh day, God came to rest in the temple. And that's the same thing we see patterned in Genesis one. Uh, Keller would say it was, it was clearly meant to be recited aloud because there's so much repetition, which would make it easy to remember. Right. So it's not. In, and then once you hit Genesis three, the style of writing changes. And it becomes more straight prose. So that's what Ken Ham and Henry Morris and, and you know others in that school reject entirely, that there's a difference between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and the rest of Genesis that might affect how we interpret it because they've completely um, saddled the inerrancy of Scripture to an interpretation of Genesis 1 that fell out of favor in the late 1700s and came back because of Ellen White and the Seventh-day Adventists in the late 1800s and then was only adopted by uh, conservative Christians after World War II. And that's, oh my goodness. that's the part that gets me. If, if Ken Ham and these others want to read Genesis 1 and 2 that way, fine. But the problem is they give no liberty for any other inerrancists of the Bible to read it any differently, right. even though history is full of people, even in their own fundamentalist camp, who don't. Right. And, and I will, I will go on record and saying because I have a lot of of young Earth creationist friends and a lot of younger, a ton of young Earth creationist fans that are tweeting to me saying, "But is it okay if I'm still a young Earth creationist?" And I'm saying, "Yes, it's okay if you're a young Earth creationist." I am not saying that young earth creationism is wrong. I am saying the position that it is the only way to read the Bible is wrong. Well put. And hasn't been a historical position. So that's what I'm, and then when I say, so when I say the Ken Ham version of young earth creationism is a relatively new thing, that's what I mean. That's saying that this resurgence, yes, there was flood geology back in the 1700s and 1600s, and it died out about 1800. That's true. Okay. And I had to go research that more because I wasn't aware of the history of flood geology. So it's not entirely from Ellen White's visions. Uh, There was a, a historic precedent for it. But taking that back into a view of inerrancy of scripture, that flood geology is the only inerrant interpretation of Genesis, is a new thing started with Henry Morris, and I reject it. Not rejecting flood geology. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Yes, floods move things, but rejecting the notion that that's the only way to treat the Bible as God's inspired word. Christian. Christian, you got you got flipped out there yeah. about ninety seconds ago. My bl- brain blew. It was actually not today, Christian. It was like ten year. No, I guess it was nineteen year old ago. Chris, homeschool mom, Christian. You know, as I am trying to teach my kid that you know the Earth was created in seven days, and that I'm letting them watch Veggie Tales, and I'm sitting here going, "Oh no." What now? The homeschool mom in 2020, what am I going to do about these two conflicting things? We're all homeschooling in 2020. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. True. It, it is. I mean, I, we, we homeschooled two of our kids for a year each when they were struggling in middle school. And so my wife started getting, I got to get the catalogs of curriculum, you know, and one of the biggest catalogs for Christian homeschooling says right on the cover, literally 100% evolution free, (laughs) you know, (laughs) you know, like it's like it's MSG in your Chinese food that'll make you sick and, you know, sleepy afterwards. So we will not sell you, you won't even have the option of buying something that says evolution is a thing, you know, and that, and that's how dogmatic we've become, you know, so I'm just, I'm just trying to educate people to say, wow, we weren't always this dogmatic about this. And actually we still aren't because you can still go, you know, whether it's Biola or Wheaton or, or Gordon Conwell or Fuller Seminary, you know, there are a lot of Christian schools you can go to that will teach you evolution and that won't say, you know, and you have to believe the world was created in seven days or you're not a Christian and you're not taking the Bible seriously. Um, but the impact of the homeschool movement and the, the kids curriculum movement in establishing young earth creationism as the only commitment to inerrancy is very, very new. And I think very, very destructive. It, it parallels a lot of other elements we've talked about in the last couple of years on the podcast, like people who believe 
voting Republican is the only legitimate way to be a Christian or, you know, fill in the blank. This is the only legitimate position to hold as a Christian. And in, in, in very, very few cases, is that true? Um, there's a lot more gray area. Sky, how do we know which are the cases where that's true? Well, this is where having some understanding of history, which you've enlightened us to today, Phil, helps. What have Christians always affirmed to be essentially Christian, to be essential to the faith? I would argue somebody who denies the deity of Jesus or who denies denies the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, has departed from Orthodox Christianity. But somebody who, who holds a different view of Genesis 1 or who votes differently than I do or, you know, fill in, though, hey, there's a lot of latitude there to be a faithful follower of Christ and disagree on those kinds of pieces. But what fundamentalism says is everything is a non is a is a non-negotiable. Right? It's essential. Yeah. It's a, everything is essential. And I think a more faithful way to follow Christ is to say there are very, very few things which are essential that are non-negotiable. And outside of that, there has to be a lot of liberty, liberty. and and grace in toward our brothers and sisters. And we need to be mindful of not declaring somebody heretical or or condemned, frankly, for holding a cultural, political, or sometimes a theological position that we may dis- There were times where Christians literally killed each other over forms of baptism. Right. And now most of us would argue, oh, that doesn't really matter as much as we thought. That's, that's how I lost my twin brother. <laughs> well, so what's interesting in this conversation, and I'm sorry to run over your joke, but um, what's interesting- no, you're supposed to laugh at my joke, Christian, <laughs> then you can say what you want to say to run over my joke. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So what's interesting is that Ken Ham is saying, I, I just find it, I did not expect you to say after all of that education that it was okay for me to believe in a young earth creation theology. You know, I expected you to say after all of that, that, you know, it seems pretty clear, you know, that the earth was probably made long ago if you take everything in balance. I so think it, I think it seems somewhat compelling that it was, but that's not the point I'm trying to that's make. That's not the point you're going to die on. That, yeah. But that's what I'm saying is so interesting. That isn't the point you're trying to make. You, you, the point you're trying to make is, you know, it is okay. Like Ken Ham is saying, I'm so sorry. I'm a little late to the party. You know, I am a little bit slower. Um but he is saying that yes, you have to believe this, or you're not a Christian, right? Well, or or you've given up on biblical on the authority of Scripture. You've given up on the authority of Scripture, which is why the world is the way it is today. So you are part of the problem of why the world is falling apart. Even though you say you're a Jesus follower, and you know, and he will say you can't be a Jesus follower and believe in an old earth, but you're part of the problem. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So Ken, Ken, I assume you're listening to this or one of your people is listening to this and transcribing it for you. You wishful thinker, you. I love you, brother. You're a good guy. Keep doing good work, but don't hold quite such a rigid view of what biblical authority is. Uh, because there's a lot of great evangelical scholarship that holds a high view of scripture and also disagrees with your uh, view of Genesis 1 and 2. And that's okay. It's okay. Keep selling tickets to the Ark and the Creation Museum. It's okay if buses of homeschool kids come through. I just wish you would back down a little bit on the certitude that you have over your specific reading of a couple of key chapters of the Bible. Because in the sense, aren't we saying, I mean, at the end of the day, the science may lead us here, and it does look compelling. But at the end of the day, only God knows how everything was made. And so are you saying that that's why it's a non-essential? <sighs> It is an, uh, which, well, what are we saying is a non-essential? How old the earth is? What I'm saying is we can't know. In, For sure. We cannot know how old the earth is. Right. 
But it, it sounds like to me, you we know, we just look at we look at arguments for and ar- arguments for different positions, for and against different positions, and you can take. I mean, it's like masks. You know, you look at for every ten articles that say masks help, you can find ten articles that where someone says I don't think they help. Um, you can decide which of those you believe, and that's the same thing about the age of the Earth. So. We just need, we need to hold some of these things a little more loosely and don't, yeah, don't make essentials out of non-essentials. You will not. uh, Because it fits into a narrative of the world that we're trying to promote. You will not find a historic creed of the church that includes a young earth creationist idea. It, they do include believe in God the Father, Creator of heaven and earth, but the details of that creation are not there. So yeah, it's um, yeah. Okay, a mess. We gotta wrap it up. We, I'm sure this won't get me into any trouble whatsoever with anybody, and yet I should turn it into a video at some point when I when I have time because I do think it is important. Because I, I mean, I even just in the last few weeks, I've gotten you know, emails from kids saying, you know, I almost lost my faith because I thought I had to choose between Jesus and science, wow. you know, and I finally decided I didn't. And I'm, you know, either, or, and that's why I'm out. And I've heard from people who say that, and that's why I'm out. Or people say, I decided that, you know, I, I could read uh, Genesis 1 differently and kept my faith and my science. So, anyway, um, it was a fun year. What would we say it was a fun year, 2020 oh, overall? Nice. Oh. Yeah, it was a wonderful year. Uh, join us. Oh, the live stream already happened. Don't join us on the live stream because it already happened. But uh, join us next year. Thank you for your support this year. You guys really kept us uh, having fun and kept us on our toes. Thank you for your support this year. And we will see you in 2021 where everything will be better. Bye, everyone. Okay, g- g- bye, g- bye, guys. Bye, everybody. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Phil Vischer Enterprises, that's Phil's company, and Sky Pilot Media, that's Sky's company. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, and more.